Good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome to our service this morning. We are pleased that you chose to join us in worship. And for those of you who are joining us online, welcome to you as well. Reading from Psalm 96, verses 1 through 4. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the privilege of gathering here to worship you. We lift your name up in praise and adoration. We thank you for each one who has gathered here in this building and online as well. We're grateful for this opportunity and we feel blessed to be able to gather here freely. We pray for each part of our service, for the reading of your word, for the spoken word, for the songs that we sing, for the prayers that we offer, may all be done to your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. I just wanted to go over a couple announcements real quick. There are some new updates. Iron Range Renewal is having several free concerts. It's based on a family-oriented environment, so it's going to be family-friendly. Bring your own chairs for seating. It's going to be housed over at the, oh, where does it say on here? Discovery the Discovery Center. Thank you, Joyce. Um, let's see here. The next one is a fellowship ministry is hosting a fifth Sunday ice cream social after church today. So if you like sweets like I do, stay after and have some ice cream. And then a heads up to all of us ladies. Um, there is a ladies Christmas event that's, gonna, that's in the process of being planned sometime in December. There's going to be more details on that coming soon in the near future. And as we all know, we're changing over to a new instant alert system. So that's going to be happening, I believe, right away next week. Um, the instant alert system is going to be changing from the Honeywell to Groupcast. So it starts September 1st is when you'll start getting your new announcements through Groupcast. Any questions on that, feel free to reach out to Vicki Tucker for more details. There's going to be a little bit different way of how you can get your announcements and your notifications. And the last event I wanted to go over is upcoming camps for the fall. So for 2021 into 2022 year for grades 7 through 12 at Trout Camp, the fall retreats, there's Quest 1, 2, and 3, and there's, um, the third one is called Breakaway. So October 1st through the 3rd is Quest 1. The 8th through the 10th of October is Quest 2. And then the breakaway camp is October 22nd to the 24th. The cost for this is $50 per student, and there's no cost for adults. And then it's our student ministry team. It's actually paying for any of the additional costs. So registration opens up on Monday, September 13th, so just in a couple of weeks. So next up is Tracy. She does have a couple of announcements. Good morning. I want to share with you some highlights from the corn feed from last Sunday. Looking at my loads, notes from last year, we served 126 people. This year, we served 174. This next year, we're already thinking for next year already. We're going to do a backpack and school supply drive for the kids in our area. Um, we're going to Hopefully our goal is to 
set up 50 backpacks that we can give to our local children to use in school. Um, we're going to have, if you go into the stores now and see the clearance on school supplies, we're going to have a um, tote out in the foyer. If you want to pick them up now and just throw them in the tote, you're welcome to. Otherwise, we are going to try and do a drive in July of next year to raise money to, to pay for these backpacks and get them going. I'm also working on a grant through um, Walmart and Target to, for nonprofit and see if we can um, get a grant for school supplies also to house more children. Um, if you would like to make a cash donation on your offering or tithely, just please note in the memo section so that they know where the money's supposed to go to. And I really would like to thank all the people that helped, all the workers, all the teardown, set up, everything. Thank you guys. We turned around and we made, we served 50 more people. Let's do that next year. Thank you. Please join me as we bring our hearts back together in prayer. Good to see everybody again. Thanks. Dear Lord, we just join together as a church family to pray and lift up the needs of our church family as well as extended family and those in our community, country, and world. Lord, we just lift up the needs of Emmanuel and the families that are facing spiritual, emotional, physical challenges, Lord, we just pray for them, pray for comfort, pray for healing, pray for encouragement, strength for those directly and those supporting them. We lift them up for your healing touch. We give you praise for the prayers you have answered, for the healing you have provided. Lord, we pray for the ministries of Emmanuel that are coming up here as we are on the verge of fall season with Sunday school and Awana and Fusion youth programs. We pray that you give the energy and enthusiasm to the leaders and bring the kids and youth forward. Help work in their lives, Lord, and encourage them and strengthen them and and bring your, your truth forward. Lord, we pray for our sister church in Krasnoselia for continued provision and guidance and opportunities to spread your good word. We pray for Bob and Lisa Schwartz, Lord, our missionaries of the week and the work they do with MMS Aviation and preparing missionaries to go out into the world. Pray for strength, encouragement, opportunities to continue to come forward for them. Pray for their son David as he looks for a job as well, Lord. We just give you thanks for what you've provided and we just pray for your guidance as we look ahead with the future of Emmanuel and over the next several weeks evaluating a pastoral candidate looking at some other changes with the Constitution, Lord, and really looking to set a new ch or chart a new course for the future of this church body, Lord. We just pray for your guidance in that process. Help us to see where you want to lead us. Help us to be open to new ideas and to embrace those new ideas or changes, even if it makes us uncomfortable at times. We know that life can never be comfortable, that we're always going to face challenges, but also opportunities. Lord, we pray for our servicemen and women, Lord, that are serving throughout the world. And we just, as we're brought back to reality, Lord, this just a couple of days ago, that there's 13 who aren't coming back to their loved ones, Lord, that there is an ultimate sacrifice that they continue to give and their families give by serving. 
And so, Lord, we just pray for protection and encouragement and strength for those that continue to serve, both overseas and in country, for those that are directly tied to our church family, Lord. Just pray that hedge of protection around them, Lord, and pray that you will provide that uh, protection and bring them home safely. And that your good word can be heard by many others. Lord, even though there's challenges throughout the world, there's struggles, we know that you reign true and strong as the one true God, Lord, and we just are so thankful for all that you provide and all that you forgive us each and every day. And we thank you that you gave us that one and great sacrifice, your son, Jesus, and that by believing in him, we can have eternal life. We thank you for that, that one true gift that we fall short on and we can never repay. So help us to step through the opportunities that, that are presented to us to speak your good word, to be salt and light in our community and beyond. Give us that encouragement and strength and peace. In your precious and holy name we pray, amen. You may stand and sing with us. We got some power and it's in the blood of Jesus.
song is God is able. It says he will never leave us. He will never fail us. Stay. He washed it white 
For any of you who may have missed this announcement last Sunday, we do have a candidate for our pastoral position opening, and uh, his name is Chris Tyan, and his wife's name is Julie, and um, we will be having our candidate weekend, the weekend of September 18th and 19th. So uh, we will, we're working on the itinerary for that um, right now, and we'll give you uh, many more details as they become available. As you know, uh, our pastor, interim pastor, is on vacation this week, and so they're getting some much needed rest. Our guest speaker this morning is Craig Skalko, and he is with the Anchor Point Church. He's an elder with that church. That church has three different uh, sites currently, one in Friedenburg, one in Duluth, and one in Two Harbors. And he is an elder for them, and he speaks at all three sites. So we're happy to have him join us. By the way, he's also um, Maggie Chapin's husband, so Jeff and Jill's son-in-law as well. So Craig, please join us. Thank you. Thanks, Dan, and uh, good morning, everybody. It's good to be here and good to be with you. Um, like Dan mentioned, my name is Craig, and uh, I'm on the preaching team and an elder at Anchor Point Church in Duluth. Um, been there for about three years, but uh, from Virginia originally, so um, it's good to be back up on the range. And like Dan also said, I'm married to Jeff and Jill's um, daughter, and so whether you know that or not, that puts me uh, deeply in debt to all of you who have been... Uh, uh, church family to them over over the years, so I'm happy to be here today and give a little bit back for for that. So if you take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to be preaching this morning on verses 1 through 5 of that text, and uh, as you're turning there, just by way of introduction, um, I'll simply mention that this, uh, this text this morning is one that bears on every relationship that we have as Christians. Uh, it bears on every church relationship and church situation that any Christian would find themselves in. And so even though I don't know many of you, I can guarantee that this will be something that, uh, as Jesus speaks to his disciples, will be highly applicable to your own life. Uh, the text is the judge not text, and so um, it some, has something for each of us this morning. So I'll uh, read the passage and pray, and we'll dive right into it. Jesus is uh, sitting on the mountain, this is in the Sermon on the Mount, with his disciples, and he says to them, Judge not, that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye. You hypocrite. 
First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Let us pray. Our Father, we do thank you again this morning for uh, this opportunity to gather, to worship uh, in safety and in peace, and in light of what's happening in the world, we are especially grateful for that, and we do pray for our brothers and sisters in the Middle East, in particular in Afghanistan, who are uh, even now at risk of uh, horrible things, murder, torture, rape, worse. And um, we ask you to be with them and strengthen them in the same way that you'd strengthen each of us this morning, uh, minister to our needs, whatever those might be. And as we uh, look through your word, would you cause it to be active and powerful in each of our hearts and bear fruit in each of our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So verse 1 of this text begins, Jesus says, judge not that you be not judged. As I said, we are in the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, at Anchor Point we're going through this, uh, this text together, so I did not pick this uh, text out of any maliciousness or uh, special reason, but uh, it's where I've been at uh, in my own church. And so Jesus has been teaching us about the um, kind of rules of life in the kingdom of God. It's sort of spirituality 101. Uh, he teaches us what it is to be, uh, how to, what it really means to live a righteous life, a righteousness that is in the heart. Uh, he teaches us how we are to go about our religious duties, like giving to the poor and prayer and fasting, and how we ought not to seek our own self-aggrandizement, but simply to be content with our God who sees in secret uh, approving us. And now he moves to the sort of interpersonal sphere. Uh, he's dealing with how disciples are to treat one another. Judge not that you be not judged. So to judge simply means to render a verdict, make a decisive determination, often in a legal context. Judgment could be positive, could be neutral, but in this passage the context makes it clear that we are talking about judgment in a negative sense, one of condemnation work to be done before we go through the text. Um, you know, Christian writers throughout the history have recognized that this passage has caused a lot of confusion to many people. If you're familiar with the late uh, Bible teacher R.C. Sproul, he said of uh, this verse, Matthew 7, 1, that it is the one text that every pagan in America knows is in the Bible. We're told that since we are not to judge, that the church cannot confront any sin that faces it in the world around it. When non-believers are confronted with the word of God, this verse becomes their ever-present refuge, their help in time of trouble, and their escape from a confrontation with the finger of God being pointed at them. But sadly, it's not just non-believers. Many people who have subscribed to what is becoming the more liberal streams of thought within Christianity, have also adopted this verse as their own convenient anthem to avoid taking a biblical stance on the issues of the day. Because we shouldn't judge, they say, then we cannot speak out against the sins that are being championed outside the church on the one hand, but also inside it by professing Christians on the other. And so just briefly, I want to encourage you that that perspective, if you've heard it, flies in the face of all of the New Testament, it would render most of the Bible meaningless and unintelligible, if true. A couple examples, I want you to think of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11, where the church is commanded to expose the works of darkness being carried out by the sons of disobedience. It would be impossible, wouldn't it, to expose something as a work of darkness without, in some sense, making a judgment upon that thing that it is, in fact, sin. Think also of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where Paul reprimands the church in Corinth for failing to uh, do church discipline with a man who was in a relationship with his stepmother. And Paul commands them to publicly excommunicate the person. 
And he says that we are to judge those within the church who persist in this sort of unrepentant, serious sin. We could give many other examples. But just to be brief, we're called and we're even commanded to identify sin as sin and to call those practicing it to repentance both inside the church and out of it. And this, of course, does not give us a license to be unkind or mean or rude with people, but simply that when God has already pronounced his judgment and asked us to speak, we have to be solid on the fact that it is our duty and that that does not constitute judgment but obedience. So what about Jesus? If you were to look ahead to verse 6 in Matthew chapter 7, you'd see that he commands us not to cast holy things, things pertaining to the gospel before what he calls, his words, not mine, dogs and swine. Which again would intimate that we are supposed at some point able to render a determination that a person is no longer worth engaging with the gospel at a certain time. That they've become hardened, they've become obstinate in their rebellion. Just a few more verses, Jesus will tell us to know false prophets by their fruit. Again, the implication being that we can and should identify themselves to protect, identify them as such to protect ourselves and to protect the church. So I hope you can see that even though we're commanded here not to judge, that there are also many ways in which we are to judge in the sense of making discernments, and hence a lot of the confusion. So I hope I haven't. Uh, qualified and caveated this to death, but the question remains, what is Jesus talking about? What precisely is he forbidding here when he tells his disciples and tells us, judge not? So I'm going to walk through this text verse by verse, but just to clear up any confusion and to give you an idea at the outset of what we're talking about, I'm going to point out a few things from the text before we get into it. If you have your Bibles and you look at verses 3, 4, and 5, you'll see that they all use the term brother. Brother. A brother refers to a person's fellow disciple, another Christian, which tells us that Jesus is forbidding a kind of judgment within and between the community of believers. He's not talking about how we relate to the outside world, non-believers, anything like that. We're talking about interpersonal relationships between Christians, not the church and the outside world. Second, also in verses 3 and 4, you'll see that it warns us against being the type of person who sees specks in our brother's eye and seeks to remove them. Specks. This is not a picture of a person confronting some serious sin in a person's life. It's the picture of a person who is nitpicky and critical. Somebody who makes harsh judgments about fellow believers and condemns them for insignificant, trivial things. Third, also in verses 3 and 4, if you continue to look there, the person Jesus is talking about is a person who fails to perceive and to correct his or her own serious sins. These are situations where there is little to no self-reflection, self-awareness, which if a person would have it and engage in it, would render them much more gentle and charitable towards the people around them. So if you put it all together, the judgment that Jesus is forbidding here is that judgment of a person who fails to perceive and correct his own serious sins, yet who is eager to condemn the small faults of their fellow believers, which in verse 5 earns them the title of hypocrite. So I want to give you just a few quotes to fill out the picture from other men to help illustrate this. John Chrysostom describes these people as, quote, those who are full of innumerable ills, innumerable sins, and trample upon other men, for trifles. John Calvin describes these type of judges as, quote, those severe judges who take so much delight in sifting through the faults of others, inquiring into the actions of others, condemning any trivial faults as if it had been 
a very heinous crime, looking disdainfully at every action and passing an unfavorable judgment on it, even when it might have been viewed in a good light. Meanwhile, they throw their own sins behind their back." Unquote. Augustine describes them as those who, quote, judge rashly respecting things that are uncertain and readily find fault. People who love to censure and to condemn rather than to amend and improve. So if you read the Sermon on the Mount, I'm sure most of you have read it several times, at least, the fact that Jesus warns us and commands us against this sort of behavior must mean that we are exceedingly prone to it. You might be thinking to yourself, I know somebody like that. That's what the Sermon on the Mount doesn't want you to do. The point of the Sermon on the Mount is that you have been someone like that. I have been someone like that. I will be someone like that again, but for the grace of God active towards me. Our tendency will always be towards the criticism of other people rather than ourselves. Of harsh condemnation of others while giving ourselves the benefit of the doubt. Elsewhere in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaches us about prayer and fasting and giving to the poor. And he says to make sure that we do it in such a way that it is in secret so that we can't lift ourselves up in pride. Here the temptation is the opposite to pick at other people, to push them down, trample them under our feet. But the result is the exact same, the safeguarding of our pride and lifting ourselves up. It's a good illustration of how the devil will take a single weakness that we might have and seek to exploit it from multiple directions. And if nothing else, the Sermon on the Mount should teach us that we are each desperately in need of God's grace and the power that only he can give to keep us from falling off the horse on one side or the other and sticking on in the right way. And as I said at the beginning, this is imperative for the health not only of every Christian relationship but for the health of every Christian church. So, I'm going to return now to verse 1 if you want to follow along and, and walk through this. Uh, verse 1 and Continuing on to verse 2, Jesus gives his disciples the most compelling of reasons not to engage in this sort of waspish, harsh, overly critical behavior. And he allows us to have a bit of healthy self-interest. Judge not that you be not judged. And again, as an explanation in verse 2, he says, with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So there's a principle of reciprocation going on. With the judgment that we judge, we will be judged. With the measure that we use, and that imagery of measurement is drawn from a commercial marketplace, like a, someone sitting in a, in a square measuring out grain to be sold. With the measure that we use this judgment, it will be measured back to us. The degree of judgment that we receive will be in direct proportion to that which we ourselves have doled out while leaving our own sins uncorrected. And so, the million dollar question here is judged by whom? When we engage in this sort of harsh condemnation of our brothers and sisters over small things, Whose judgment do we provoke? Now on the one hand, as I've said, the main idea in this passage that Jesus is dealing with is addressing relationships that we have between believers in the church to maintain harmony and unity. And so it's certainly possible, and many people take this position, that the judgment Jesus is referring to is simply to be understood at the human level. In other words, that other Christians will be less charitable towards you if you are not charitable towards them. And I think we can certainly understand that, that at some point, in response to a person who does nothing but poke and prod at our most insignificant shortcomings, that our love for them, that love which is supposed to cover a multitude of sins, 
that love which is supposed to forgive 70 times seven times may in fact be exhausted or at least greatly reduced with the result that within the church we cease to be charitable to one another. This is the sort of thing that degrades churches over time and erodes fellowships. It is what Paul warns the Galatians about in chapter 5 when he tells them, if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. And we certainly need to be aware of that. But I think that if you were to limit Jesus' meaning to the human level, you'd be making a mistake. Because it is God, and God alone, who possesses the power and the divine right to condemn or to acquit. James chapter 4 verse 12 says that there is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. So who are you to judge your neighbor? And as we go through the Sermon on the Mount, Again and again, it's our Heavenly Father who we're to please. It's not dealing with other people. It's our Father who will forgive our trespasses if we forgive others. And so if a person insists on this harsh condemnation of other believers, I don't think it's merely the judgment of other human beings who they will provoke, though they certainly will. But it's the judgment of God. And this raises some questions if you're somebody who thinks deeply about the gospel. You could be thinking to yourself, wait just a second. I've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ to save me from my sins. I have put my faith in the perfect work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. He has borne my sins in his body upon the tree. He has clothed me in his own righteousness and reconciled me entirely to God. He is now risen from the dead and all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him and he now has offered himself once for all to God the Father on my behalf and he has secured eternal redemption for me and even now he intercedes for me and Paul says in Romans chapter 8 that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so how is it then that I can fall into this sort of judgment if in my weakness I judge other people more harshly than I should? How is it that God can render judgment upon me measure for measure when God himself has acquitted and justified me? That's the question. And I want to affirm clear, clearly that it is, of course, true that if any person, no matter who they are, if any person comes to Jesus Christ in repentance and faith, even if their life has been spent on nothing but dissipation and corruption, like the prodigal son, even if it isn't until the 11th hour of the day that they go into the Lord's vineyard, like in the parable, even if it's just a few minutes before their death, that they will still find Jesus Christ to be both willing and entirely able to bring them safely into paradise. He himself said to the man dying beside him on the cross, that man who had lived his life in nothing but sin, today you shall be with me, even though that man's life had been nothing but evil. Any person who cast themselves at the feet of Jesus Christ will find such an inexhaustible abundance of God's grace and mercy towards them that every transgression will be blotted out and the judgment of eternal damnation will be entirely averted. The gates of paradise will have been swung open to them and they will take and drink from the water of life without price. And Jesus will not fail to take each and every one of his sheep safely into the pastures of heaven. Raise all who believe on him to eternal life. This is the gospel that we must believe. But the thing is, we have to believe all of the Bible. We have to receive everything that the apostles have taught us. And as we rejoice and triumph in the work of Christ in behalf of sinners, 
We cannot let that take us further than it took the apostles. We celebrate God's grace in the gospel. We treasure the peace and joy and redemption which are ours and which can never be revoked for those who have believed. And yet, there are words like these addressed not to unbelievers but to Christians in the Bible. 2 Corinthians 5.10, Paul says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Again, he says in Romans chapter 14, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Each of us must give an account of himself to God. So again, even though we are Christians and if we have truly trusted in Christ, our salvation is assured. The final condemnation of hell is entirely done away with. The fact remains that we still must stand before our God and judge. And it says there in scripture that at that moment, even as believers, we will be tested as though by fire. It says that the purposes of our hearts will be disclosed. It says that we will give an account for every careless word that we have spoken. There's a passage in James chapter 3 that says that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Which is why not many people should become teachers. It's the same thing. Jesus teaches us here that the more we judge, the greater the exactitude and rigor with which we will be judged and in direct proportion. And though we have assurance, divine assurance of our ultimate pardon through the work of Christ, this should still be a fearful thing. The author of the Hebrews says it is always a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And therefore it is a most excellent reason for Jesus at the outset of his ministry to command his disciples, judge not. He wants to keep us from that. And it is therefore not to be taken as a heavy load, hard to bear, like the Pharisees might put upon their disciples. But our Lord is graciously bringing this truth to our attention so that when we stand before Christ at the end, we will not have such a strict and searching encounter. And so, moving on to verse 3, Jesus asks us a couple of rhetorical questions meant to illuminate the meaning of what he said and to make clear why exactly we should be so cautious about condemning the faults of other people around us, particularly in the church. And the unfortunate and uncomfortable answer is that we ourselves are guilty of far worse than what we see other people doing. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own? Jesus' occupation, his trade, was a carpenter. And he's drawing here from his experience in the wood shop. If you work with wood, I don't. But if you do, you would probably know that it is always recommended to wear eye protection. Because as you're working with wood, there will be little pieces of debris, dust that get kicked up, and if you do not have adequate shielding over your eyes, they will inevitably find their way there and settle there and cause you much consternation. The point is that a speck is something that is vanishingly small. If you've ever been around a person who has a speck, something stuck in their eye, you probably couldn't see it, I'd wager, but instead you simply notice them wincing or maybe the waterworks starting to run as they try to get it out. You'd have to examine your friend very closely, wouldn't you? Maybe under a microscope to see the speck that is causing them all this 
trouble. Jesus is saying that in the spiritual order of things, it's exactly what we do. That we have an innate ability to keenly see even the smallest faults of other people. Again, we're not talking about grave, serious sins. The Bible is clear that we have to identify those and confront them for the spiritual health of the other person. We're talking about specks. And yet we excel in the investigation of such specks when it comes to our brothers and sisters. We are each a finely tuned speck surveillance system. We keep a watchful eye on other people. We take note of the smallest character issues that those around us have. And then, again, our tendency is to condemn them very harshly for these little things. And the chief problem with that is that this eagle eye, this superpower that we have, is only effective for 99.99% of people on the planet. And in fact, it is woefully inept at assessing the faults of the one single person on God's green earth that it is meant to function appropriately for ourselves. Jesus says that for all of this skill we have at assessing other people, you don't notice the log that is in your own eye. Which, that word log refers to, if anyone's a woodworker or a builder or something, it refers to that main beam, structural timber in a house, usually at the roof. Homes back then were not typically as large, but we're still talking about a massive piece of wood in contrast to a speck. And this imagery is supposed to be deliberately silly and outlandish. Jesus was good at these sort of illustrations, memorable. Camels going through the eyes of needles, Pharisees straining out gnats with some fly paper and yet swallowing a camel. And now, roofing beams sticking out of someone's eye socket. His meaning is that while we manage, again, to dissect the hearts and words and deeds of other people on guard for the smallest infractions that they might commit, we're all too often totally oblivious to the major sins and major spiritual problems that lurk in our own life. Or if we are aware of them, we give ourselves a pass. We read the deeds of other people in the worst possible light. We treat them harshly. And we read our own deeds in the best possible light and treat ourselves with the utmost understanding. So knowing that Jesus is perfect and that our Lord's teaching is perfect, I trust that simply having this read and explained immediately brings your own tendency for this into focus. As a test, you could simply ask yourself, how much time have I spent this week thinking about the sins and flaws and shortcomings of other people? And in comparison, how much time have I spent thinking about my own? And how great do I perceive the sins of other people to be as compared to my own? If we're honest, I'm certain that each of us will find ourselves at the wrong end of this whole specks and logs illustration. Staying in verse 3 here, Jesus also hints towards the means of correction, healing, how we can avoid this unfortunate behavior. Look again at where he says, you do not notice the log in your own eye. That word that's translated as notice means to consider carefully, to contemplate. It describes a thorough and intense examination of one's own life and condition. And Jesus says, why don't you do this? Translation, you should do this. You must do this. You need to do this. If you find it easy to condemn and judge other believers, the solution is to take a long, hard look at yourself each time you're tempted to do so. 
Not a passing glance, not a quick once over, but an intense searching of your own heart. In my own background, we used to call that an examination of conscience. And you can rest assured that if you would do that, whatever speck you have uncovered in the eye of your brother or sister will be outstripped and outdone by something that you find within yourself. And therefore, if you've understood Jesus' words so far in this text, the result will be that you will be very slow and cautious to condemn other people. Because you know that with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And you will have identified that you have far worse transgressions to deal with yourself. Paul gets at the same idea in Romans chapter 2 when he says, when you pass judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. It's true. We say, so-and-so is in sin because the Bible says to do X and they're doing not X. On the one hand, it's a very good standard to evaluate our lives by what the Bible asks of us. But the question is then, okay, the standard of judgment is obedience to the Word of God. Have I been obedient to all that the Bible has to say in my own life? And I need to contemplate that very well before I deal harshly with my brother or sister because I will be judged in equal measure. Second question, verse 4. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye, excuse me, out of your eye, when there is the log in your own eye? So we're still dealing with this whole idea of hypocrisy, logs, specks, us on the wrong end. But Jesus goes beyond our mere noticing of the faults of other people and a lack of awareness about ourselves. Because the truth is that we don't simply usually content ourselves with just observing the sins of other people. We are tempted to correct, to remove specks in the eyes of other people. Which we'll see is not a bad thing in and of itself. When we get to verse 5, it's implied that there is an appropriate way to deal with giving help and correction to our brothers and sisters, even when we are dealing with little tiny specks. And there's other places where we have to bring sin to people's attention, like I've already said, to preach the gospel to them, to exercise church discipline within our marriages and families to keep them in order, and so on. But it is in the context of this undue condemnation and this hypocrisy and a failure to contemplate our own sins that this becomes a problem. Jesus literally says here, behold the beam in your own eye. To emphasize this point, the guy who has the roofing beam sticking out of his eye socket is now going to approach the man who has some minor eye irritation and offer him medical treatment. The ridiculous image is the point. It's that we cannot help people around us overcome these small sins when we ourselves are drowning in far worse. And if we refuse to rectify our own faults, then we have no business trying to fix up other people. It only increases this whole thing of hypocrisy. It only lays us open to further judgments. Because think about it, not only then would you condemn yourself by recognizing the sin of another person when we do far worse, but then in trying to correct them, we show that we know that sin in a person's life must be reformed. And yet we refuse to do it ourselves. And so we convict ourselves twice over. Double jeopardy. This is simply the height of hypocrisy. And for the health of every church and every relationship, it must be done away with. Which is exactly what Jesus calls us to do in verse 5. He says, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. This is the only time in Matthew's gospel where the term hypocrite is used of disciples. 
And it ought to tell us something about the danger that this particular vice poses to us and how careful we should be to avoid it. Jesus wants his disciples to know that if they fail to examine themselves while scrutinizing other people, if they refuse to reform their own life while demanding that other people clean up their act, that this is counterfeit Christianity. It's nothing to do but a theatrical production. It's no more real than the Pharisee on the street corner. And when we're faking it, we're in no position to help a brother or sister who has stumbled in some small way, because in our blindness, we will act with unnecessary, unnecessary severity and harshness, which does no good. Many of you have probably experienced that at some point in your life. And so, thankfully, here at the end, Jesus provides the remedy. He says if we want to truly be of use to our brothers and sisters, if we want to avoid this severe judgment from God, he says, first take the log out of your own eye. Very simply, this means examining ourselves, coming to understand our own sin, looking constantly to see where we have gone against the will of God, and then doing everything we can to conform our own life to what he asks of us first before we open our mouth in judgment of our neighbors. Now for some people, that might mean turning from sin and placing your faith in Jesus Christ for the first time in order to walk in newness of life. For other people, it might simply mean shaking yourself out of spiritual sleep. But it is only when our own faults have been illuminated that we can see clearly to help anybody else. Otherwise, again, in our ignorance of ourselves and thinking ourselves to be far, far better, we will act with haughtiness and pride and condescension. So the whole point is, as I said, Jesus' aim here is to safeguard Christian communities like this one, like the one I attend, from the needless backbiting, the strife, the anger that can result from harsh and overly critical people. He motiv motivates us towards that by warning us of this stricter judgment that we will incur. But it is the harmony and the building up of the church that is his chief concern. He doesn't want churches to fall apart. And we see that at the end of verse 5, part of building each other up and staying together is indeed to bring sin to one another's attention and helping to correct it. Seeing clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye is not presented as a bad thing. Seeing clearly is a good thing. It's blindness that is a bad thing. But when the church functions properly, when each of us puts away our own blindness and critical spirit, when each of us reforms our own life according to the will of God, we will then begin to help each other along, yes, and correct sin from time to time, but not with condemnation, but love and goodwill. See, if we become people whose strictest examination is reserved for ourselves, if we would all be people who contemplate our own faults first with the utmost sobriety, if we would be people who are consumed with reforming our own lives first and foremost, and who know that there is this condemnation that will be repaid to us by God as we dole it out, the result is that the way in which we deal with our brothers and sisters when they stumble will change. Gone will be haughtiness and pride because we will each account ourselves to be the worst of sinners. We will know that we ourselves are over our heads in debt to the mercy and grace of God. And therefore, gone will be undue criticism and condemnation. Because with fear and trembling, we ourselves will anticipate this encounter that we must have with him to give an account. 
Gone will be the urge to judge the heart and mind of other people because we know that all too often we do not even understand our own. And therefore, bitterness towards our brothers will be replaced by meekness. Condescension towards our sisters will be replaced with understanding. Violence by tenderness and gentleness. Anger by patience. Pride by humility. And hypocrisy by genuine love and goodwill towards another person who is also a trophy of grace purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. We will no longer trample them down. We will lift them up. And though we will correct them, we have to correct each other. It will be, as one person says, quote, not as a foe, not as an adversary exacting a penalty, but as a physician applying medicines. And then in each of our churches, if we do this, each member of the body of Christ will advance in sanctification. The church will grow as it is meant to grow, building itself up, knitting itself together in love. This is what life in the church is supposed to be like. And so often it isn't. And it's why we have to avoid a critical judgmental spirit which can only tear other people down and never build them up. So as a conclusion, I simply want to read to you from uh, the homily of Augustine in this passage. He sums up how we should treat other people in light of this better than I could. He says, and I quote, Therefore, we must piously and cautiously watch so that when necessity shall compel us to find fault with or rebuke anyone, we may reflect first whether the fault is such as we've never had or one from which we've now become free. And if we've never had it, if we've never fallen into this sin or fault, let us reflect that we are men and might have had it, but for the grace of God is what he means. But if we have had it, and we are now free from it, let the common infirmity touch the memory. In other words, remember who you were. So that not hatred, but pity may go before the fault finding or rebuke. If, however, on reflection, we find ourselves involved in the same fault as he is, whom we were preparing to censure, if we find that log in our own eye, he says, let us not censure nor rebuke, but let us mourn deeply over the case. And let us invite him not to obey us, but to join us in a common effort. This is how we're to live. And so, let us pray now that God who has redeemed us by the blood of his only son, that he would reveal our faults to us first daily by his spirit, keeping them always before our face, that we would keep his grace and his mercy always in front of mind. Let us ask God to provoke in us a spirit of repentance and sorrow over our own failings, and so make us gentle and kind towards other people in times of stumbling. May we all be certain the same Christ who purchased our sanctification, who is so patient with us, who will not fail to bring us, though we are miserable sinners so often, safely to paradise and sanctify us completely, that he will do the same for everyone else who calls on his name, wherever they are. And therefore, let us regard them, as I said, as trophies of grace, and be patient and kind and love them. Let us pray. God, our Father, we do again thank you for these words of Jesus, which are so clear and so sharp. We confess that so often we have 
given ourselves a pass, have been content with coming down on other people. Would you forgive us that offense? Help all of us in every place, in every church, to never forget the grace that we've received, the long-suffering patience that you've shown towards us, that even while we were sinners, Christ died for us, that you reconciled us to yourself when we wanted nothing to do with you, and that even now you pour out your spirit and grace in such abundance that we never deserve. In light of that, would you please help us to treat our brothers and sisters and all around us with gentleness and kindness and reverence them also as your beloved children. We ask that you'll do this for your own eternal glory so that one day we may all stand around your throne together as one with no disunity and praise you forever and ever. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. So with that, I'll just dismiss you with the uh, words of Numbers chapter six. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>